Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to our event tonight. My name is Gerda Armstrong and I'm the director of the John Rylands Research Institute here at the University of Manchester. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce this year's Research Institute Distinguished Lecture, which will be given by our Simon and Hallsworth Visiting Professor in Cultural Heritage Science, Professor Ian Rabin, from the German Federal Institute for Materials, Research and Testing in Berlin. So before I introduce her, uh, there are just a few housekeeping things to mention. First of all, this event is being recorded and it will be edited and made available on the John Rylands Library YouTube channel. Auto subtitles are available using your own settings. We're using Zoom webinar format, so this means that your camera and mic is disabled on entry. At the end of the lecture, there's going to be some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask one, could you ask, add your questions to the Q&A function that you should see on your Zoom screen? These will be selected by my colleague, Professor Stefan Hans, just out of shot. Um, we'll chair the questions and they'll be conveyed to the panel. I think your legs are really shot. Um, <laughs> you can also use the chat function for additional comments as well. And we'll be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat function during the seminar. So to judge by the number of people who've joined us for this lecture tonight, Professor Rabin is already very well known to many people, but I'd like to say a few words about her anyway. Ira Rabin is one of the leading academics worldwide in the material scientific analysis of written artifacts and cultural heritage, with many decades of experience in the field. She's published very widely and led numerous field shaping projects, and she's a sought after global expert in her many areas of excellence. She already knows the Rylands collections very well, having been a core part of the team which resumed the scientific analysis of the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in 2006, following on after the initial scientific analysis, which took place in the 1950s. And here she worked with George Brooke and George, uh, John Prague. As visiting professor this year, Professor Rabin is now collaborating with us on strategic development, infrastructure and capacity building in the field of cultural heritage science, as well as helping us develop new interdisciplinary research projects. So we're incredibly grateful that Ira will share a career's worth of expertise with us tonight, especially as she has cold. Um, so Ira, <laughs> thank you so much for coming and over to you. Yeah, it starts already that I cannot move to, okay. First of all, I would like to thank the Institute for inviting me and letting me uh, giving me this possibility to talk about uh, a topic that I like very much and I spend a lot of time working on. And I hope that by the end of my lecture, you will understand why it is so exciting. So we will be looking at the black writing inks in time. Let us start at looking on the, let's say it's not exactly evolution timeline, but there are certain things we know about them. And we start with the common knowledge what actually everybody knows. We know that carbon ink was used everywhere in antiquity. We know that plant ink, or maybe it's not common knowledge, but, but it is some kind of knowledge, that um, plant ink was a traditional Byzantine ink and was used also in Northern Europe. And we know that iron gold ink, the most popular ink of the Middle Ages, was actually used everywhere in the Middle Ages. And the green uh, uh, color indicates that some of the things that were already checked. So there were any number of analytical results showing that indeed in the Middle Ages, almost everybody was using iron gold ink. Now let us look what we know about the recipes. In the uh, Greek or Roman world, we have quite a number of different uh, recipes uh, of the carbon ink. And uh, some of those recipes become are very interesting because they suggest not only mixing soot with gum and uh, some kind of, a, of a, an aqueous media, but also sometimes to add uh, some kind of a strange substances. And one of this is copper-based substance. You can see it here on the uh, <coughs> recipe of Bios Kuridis. We know that basically in Europe, uh, carbon ink stopped being used as a writing ink about in the early Middle Ages, but it returned sometime about 12th century of uh, um, our time. Now, with the plant ink, it's a bit difficult because there are not that many recipes, but one of the recipes that we know is of Martianus Capella of from the 5th century of our time. Iron gold ink. Here we start having a little bit of problems 
Uh, first of all, there is a very interesting and strange recipe from the third century before our time, before common era, which suggests to, it's a secret ink. It says if you write with garnet extract on leather, you don't see anything. But if you add calcantum in this, no calcantum like Dioscorides, then you'll start seeing the text. And then we know that in Orient, in the Middle East, yeah, a multitude, plenty of recipes starting about ninth century of common era, but in Europe, they appear very, very late. Let us add now analytic results to it. And indeed, we find <clears throat> in carbon ink everywhere, basically in antiquity, uh, we find a lot of carbon ink as writing ink in the Middle East. And you see, we do not see much of it in Europe. Plant ink, yes, we do find plant ink in Germany, in Greece, in about ninth century of our time. And we find, interestingly enough, it in Egypt, in the times of uh, Philo of Byzantium. So it indeed existed, and but uh, it is not easy to find, and we'll see now in a moment why. And now iron gold ink. I remind you, in Europe, the first uh, recipe appears not before the 12th century of the Common Era. However, we find this ink basically all over the southern part of Europe and uh, the Middle East, already in the early Middle Ages or late antiquity. So now we have the first question, how come? First of all, how come people were using for thousands of years carbon ink? Why did they stop using carbon ink and why they moved to something else? And now why by the Middle Ages, everybody uses iron gold ink. However, the recipes appear very late. Uh, they appear first after basically everybody already using it. So there must be some kind of an interesting secret. Maybe we'll be able to uncover it. Now, before I go on uncovering secrets, I hope that I, I will be able to do so. I would like to tell you that first of all, of course, I'm not working alone. I'm working with a, with a big group. And then all this work started with the Dead Sea Scrolls and um, with a big project of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I can say this is my I would say lifelong project because I'm still working with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we moved actually to the Carib uh, 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 Giza and we wanted to look at the Torah scrolls after we have looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, we've worked there until 2015 and now we have resumed the project because it's very interesting since biblical and non biblical scrolls are written with different inks. Now, since we were trying to build a, 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 a evolution, a, a kind of a time axis, we decided to look into Coptic documents because Coptic documents are incredibly interesting. They have been produced for about a thousand years, basically all the time. And so we did look at them. The big problem with the Coptic ink, they were produced all the time, but they are rarely well dated. So let's go to another one, and from here we started working on the undated uh, uh, manuscripts, and we had a big project on the Greek documentary papyri. Uh, it was centered in the uh, in Berlin, in the uh, Egyptian, in the papyrus collection of Berlin, and here we have found an interesting ink in the first century BCE that contained metals. Now we're back to medieval times, and now we're working with the early, uh, with um, the oldest uh, Torah scrolls of, the, of, of Europe. And the last two projects that are running now, one is dedicated to relics, to the text of relics. And the period of time is about two, 300 years from 500 to 800. And at the time, at the same time, we're working with uh, Papiri, Herculaneum Papiri. <clears throat> so you can see from this a little bit chaotic presentation of different projects that we're always trying still to work on the lifetime or the on the on the evolution of the of the changes in the inks. Now I have been talking about the ink here, ink there. So let us start with actually looking at the ink. We have basically three types of liquid belt ink. It can be carbon ink. German is a wonderful language because it has a difference between 
an ink and carbon ink and a normal soluble ink. It doesn't exist in other languages. So this is dispersion. Carbon ink is a dispersion ink. And while <clears throat> there is a soluble ink, which is called plant ink or tannin ink. And these two inks, basically, uh, there is a parallel to, to them, I can say part parallel in iron gold inks that is produced by reaction from, uh, this is the first um, artificial ink because it's produced by a chemical reaction. Here you can see uh, actually the, how they look like. You see that the carbon ink is here and we have two more or less brown inks. Let's, the best book about all these inks is by um, uh, Monique Zerdun Bat Yehuda, unfortunately only in French, but it is a very exciting book about all kinds of different stories about the ink. So let us go very quickly about the important properties of different inks. And as I said, that the first one is a fine dispersion of carbon pigments or soot ink. And uh, its basic re recipe is very simple. You have soot, you have water, you add uh, 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 some kind of um, uh, um, something to, to, to glue it to the, to the surface. In Egypt, they were using gamma arabic. In China, they were using protein glue. And we have any number of the extent recipes. The properties of this ink are very uh, important. This is a suspension. It means it does not penetrate a substrate and sits on the surface. And this ink is black. It stays always black. It doesn't matter with what you irradiate it. If we move now to uh, the soluble ink, to the tannin ink, uh, these are extracts from tree bark or gallnuts. It is the best known description of this ink or best known recipe can be uh, found in the book of Theophilus in the 12th century. And it is produced, in that uh, book it is produced from the bark of blackthorn bush and wine. <clears throat> and allegedly in the Middle Ages, this ink was used very frequently in different scriptoria. Its properties, it is solution and it penetrates substrate very well. It has brown homogeneous color and it has beautiful optic properties. It becomes transparent if you irradiate it with um, a, a lamp at 750 nanometers. And now let us go over to the most important ink, actually the ink in question, iron gold ink, why and how it appeared. It is an ink that is produced by chemical reaction. It has two phases, a soluble and insoluble. It is produced, it has in every recipe you find four ingredients, at least four ingredients. The, and the first, the ingredients are soluble. And that's how you have a soluble phase. You need gallic acid, you need soluble iron, or sol dissolved iron, a binder, very often gamma rubbing, and it is all happens in aqueous medium. Now, the special thing about the iron gold ink that it deteriorates very heterogeneously. And in the beginning, it is black. Once it deteriorates, it becomes brown. And, uh, uh, but this brown is not a, a uniform brown, it's not homogeneous brown. It, uh, on one and same letter, you would see many different shades of this brown. Because of this soluble phase, it penetrates uh, the substrate very well, and its optical properties are very beautiful. Again, like, like the other one, it gradually loses its opacity. So in a normal, and the normal uh, uh, light, in the white light, it is very often black or brown, but it becomes less and less opaque when we change the, uh, to the longer, towards the longer wavelengths, and it becomes transparent at 1400 nanometer. These optical properties of different optical properties of different types of inks led the group uh, around uh, Robert Fuchs and Kerr to invent a method to differentiate between them. So he said, look at this, uh, at this picture now. At the top, we have iron gold ink that is quite nicely visible at 750 nanometers, still visible at 1000 nanometers, completely disappeared in 1400. The plant ink already basically disappears at 750. And when you look at the carbon ink, black and solid, whatever irradiation we take. 
However, the problem with this wonderful method is that you cannot get easily 1400 nanometers. Our normal cameras are blind actually after 1100 nanometers. So we invented a different method, which is very close, but it takes just a normal small uh, USB microscope. And instead of looking at 1400 nanometers, we look at 940 nanometers and we look at the opacity of the ink. And you can see here that plant ink already disappeared at 940 nanometers. The iron gold ink, very dark iron gold ink, becomes lack of part. It is, it is quite pale. And carbon ink didn't change its color. So this was the method that was published in 2012 and started being used universally. And here's an example how useful it can be. We're looking at the picture uh, of, 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 the, of the portion of the, of the uh, uh, page from a Talmud, and uh, you can see it's all written with black. However, when you look with a microscope, you see that these two inks are completely different. You have carbon ink, which is original text, and you have iron gold ink with the nodes. And this is kind of the methods that uh, people started using from about 2012, and today there are actually many people who are using this method and it is very helpful. So now one, let's say problem with some of these inks. And the problem is that plant ink and iron gold ink are very similar. Let us look at the difference between them. But actually, when you start doing iron gold ink, you start with the plant ink because you need the extract of the bark. You need extract of the gall nuts, which is basically plant ink. And even a small amount of iron added by chance to such an ink makes it iron gold. So here, our big question is, when we find this such an ink, was it intentionally iron gold ink? Or was it by chance? Because iron somehow entered the ink. Now let's look at those two different inks, plant and iron gold. Plant is solution, it's brown and it is homogeneous, it is actually a dye. Iron gold ink is precipitate. When you do this reaction, this black precipitate is iron gold ink, and this can be brown or black, depending on the degree, degree of deterioration. One difference between them, which is clear, is the um, homogeneity of the ink. One is homogeneous, and another is always heterogeneous. One is dye, it does not hurt, parchment or paper or papyrus. The other one is caustic. So if you are not very sure, one looks at the reaction between the ink and the substrate. And if you see that there is a little bit of deterioration of, of parchment, of, of, of um, well, papyrus, it is very probably iron gold ink. Because using a simple microscopy doesn't work this time. On the left side, you see you see uh, an ink, which looks quite homogeneous and it is very brown. On the right side, it is the same ink under uh, infrared illumination. It is completely disappeared. So we would say, okay, this must be plant ink, but we do not know. We have to check for the presence of iron, okay? This is a caution with, this, with the method that I was mentioning. So. Let us go back to the, our uh, uh, lifetime of the inks and let's see what actually happened. Why, uh, let's say iron gold ink is an ink which has metal. So probably while we're studying this uh, evolution of the ink, the first question was where, when actually the metals entered in this, in this play. And here we suddenly realized that already in antiquity, there were some metals in the ink, in the carbon ink. So carbon ink was not just carbon ink, it was carbon ink with metal. And what we see here, I'm reminding you, Dioscurides was already speaking about this and adding something based on copper. And then <clears throat> we have a secret ink of, uh, of uh, Philo of Byzantium, which is also containing copper. So from this, we can actually say, okay, Metals entered the inks already very early. So what happened after that? 
it isn't my, let's say, opinion that what happened actually was that in the times of Alexander, once started Alexander's way, one needed more ink. And it is very difficult to produce very good carbon ink. Even Pliny writes, the elder writes about difficulties of producing this ink. So people started basically adulterating the carbon ink by adding different dark liquids. And we know that that was happened because we know that in cer a certain point, there were mixed inks. What are the mixed inks? These are carbon inks or plant inks to which metals were added, okay? And indeed, plant ink plus iron is basically iron gold ink. So this would be the transition. I must say that it took about 1,000 years to, to, to go from carbon ink into, into the well-prepared normal iron gold ink. And it is probably because of that we don't have earlier recipes. However, we have any number of the recipes about mixed inks. The recipes do not come from Europe, but come from Islamic world. We have any, anyway, by far more recipes from the Middle East. And one of the oldest, one of the, actually the oldest uh, mixed ink that had carbon and copper and tannin was in the fourth century uh, before common era, which is meaning that we have indeed taken two different inks and mixed them. But it's interesting, as you can see here in all this table in the antiquity, early uh, in the antiquity or, or uh, early Middle Ages, we do not see iron. We see only copper. And this is because the metals that was being added and known under Kalpantun, um, it, it was it was, it is, was based on copper. And until 9th century, actually, people did not know that there are two different minerals that can be used or should be used to produce the ink. We will see it immediately. Now, here in this page, you see the table of the oldest inks that we could find that were contained in both parts, iron gold and carbon. And you can see here that the oldest one comes from a, a document from the fourth century before common era, meaning that uh, Pilo of Byzantium, when he was describing his secret inks, was indeed speaking about existing ink. He just suggested to use it differently on the felt and not on the papyrus as a secret ink. So we were not the only ones who published. This is the oldest one from the fourth century. In Paris, there are some beautiful papyri written in two languages. And in those papyri, um, everything in demotic is written in carbon, but all the signatures from Greek are written in either in, in uh, uh, um, copper containing iron gold inks or in mixed inks. And then you can see that we find them in Fayum. And now I have here the amounts of this metal elements. The oldest one doesn't have iron at all, has only copper. The other ones have both iron and copper and will learn immediately why. And sometimes you have more iron, sometimes you have more copper, but they're all there. Okay. After this long introduction about, about the inks and what they are, when we do it, I would remind you and myself that I am actually a scientist, means that I'm studying the inks with instruments, and let us look at how we study it. So the first one, well, you already know, it is a single step study. This gives us only the type of the ink. However, in order to understand whether we have metal in the ink, or what kind of ink is this, is it an ink containing copper, containing iron, we need another method. And this method is called X-ray fluorescence. If we are looking at the mixed inks, we need actually two methods. Why? Because with a simple microscopy and simple 940 nanometers, we cannot separate carbon inks from iron gold inks. Because the carbon ink is black and it will give the, its property to the ink. It will be just, it will does not, it would not change uh, uh, the color. So we need another method. 
either we can look at it with a longer wavelength, at the wavelengths of 1400 nanometers, whatever we see must be carbon, or we can take Raman spectroscopy, which is another method that allows us to differentiate between carbon ink and iron ball ink. But all this gives us basically only the type of the ink. What do we want? And it, it gives us metals, because it says it's iron ball ink or it is other type of the ink. What we want to look at also, it is the organic part, because the majority of the recipes give you not only the metals that are inside, they give you also the organic part. So since about four years, we're developing a new method, quasi non-destructive or micro-destructive method and mass spectrometric method to determine also the organic part in the inks, and then we will be able to characterize the ink completely. So you can see that today, Basically, when we are traveling, then we would <laughs> take some machines with us and we study them very often in on site in the different uh, archives. And then we would basically have these methods and we call it mobile lab. And you can see here one picture in which you see how we study this. You see two, two persons, one of them is me, the other is Olivier Bonbeau who was an assistant in, in, uh, at our institution, and we would pack our bags with different instruments and fly over to the interesting archive. Okay. It's right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what it is, but let us chat very shortly to see about this, especially in Manchester, because the person who, who explained this method was Henry Mosley, mm -hmm. and he lived, <laughs> he worked in Manchester. And uh, so the method is based on the recognizing characteristic X-rays of elements. If you, <clears throat> with a, uh, uh, irradiate any material with an X-ray beam, this material reacts with characteristic X-ray. And the, 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 the whole uh, mechanism is, is uh, very, rather simple, we kick out one electron on one shell, and this uh, uh, produces um, an empty space, which is unlike. So immediately another electron fills this space, and the difference between these two shells is emitted as X-ray, and this X-ray is characteristic for the element which uh, um, has been irradiated. And the result of this is characteristic X-ray. We can record as spectra. And what we see here is called spectrum. We have on the X-axis, we have energy. And you see it is in kilo electron volts. This is an energy of X-rays. And you see the different elements on this axis show, show up as, as emission peaks. And since we know exactly where each element has its emissions, we can uh, very simply uh, evaluate it and identify different elements in our uh, object. Now, not only that we can identify the objects, but also the amount, the, 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 the intensity of our peak is roughly, is, is actually correspond, uh, corresponds to the amount of this element. And so this is the method which, um, which we, we are based when we study Iron gold. Or we study anything that had metals. Why? Because in this method, you uh, this method you cannot identify very light elements like carbon, but you have a beautiful signatures of metals. So we are using this for transition metals, metals like iron, uh, copper, zinc, and and so on. Let us go back to the production of iron gold ink. You need gold nuts. You need metal and the iron metal, and usually it was used in the form of vitriol. We'll see immediately what is vitriol. And then you need gum arabic and aqueous medium. So now, here uh, you see the picture of vitriol. Vitriol is actually, it's, it's a mineral. It's a, 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 sul it's, um, a sulfated, hydrated uh, metal sulfate, and can be found in different mines. What you can see here is that vitriol that was found in the mine, in the famous mine in Ramelsberg of Goslar in Germany, 
And all these vitriols, all these uh, uh, minerals are colored. The important colors are here. Iron sulfate is green, while copper sulfate is blue. So the difference between iron sulfate, blue, and copper sulfate, uh, between uh, blue and, and green, was very difficult to discern. Moreover, until 9th century, no one knew that these are actually completely different minerals. They always thought it was one and the same mineral. And this explains to us why we always, until certain time, we always were reading about copper. And we started reading about iron very late. So I believe that when they started understanding that it is only iron that produces this ink, as it's only iron that produces black precipitate in the reaction, they started writing the recipes. Between, before that, it was kind of trial and error. Important in, in think about this video is that until 16th century, it was not really cleaned. So when people were buying vitriol to make the inks, the amount of iron and amount of other metals depended on the vitriol they bought. And you can see here the two examples. One vitriol is called Romanum and another is called Goslarensis. And you can see that both have different additions on different metals. And uh, the, the one from Gosler has quite a high amount of zinc. And the one from, from uh, it's called Romanum, that is, comes actually from, from uh, Cyprus, does not have zinc at all. So studying the amounts of these metals in, in, in the inks basically gives us the possibility to differentiate the inks according to the fingerprint of the vitriol. After 16th century, it, become, it, 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 it changes slightly because uh, vitriol is then cleaned, and, uh, but still you always, in, in, in this type of the ink, you would always have the rest of other metals. In this type of the ink, iron never comes alone. And by measuring the amount of ink of other metals uh, uh, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to iron, you can produce a fingerprint, a recognizable fingerprint of iron gold ink. Here's one example, of course, because I am in, in, in here. Here was a, I, yesterday I was allowed to see a very beautiful uh, uh, exhibition of Dura. And that's why we give, I give you an example of Dura. Here we have a drawing. And the question was, was this drawing by Dura, or is it just a poetry? And now I'll give you a big secret. It means everybody knows the secret by now. Uh, uh, Dura was not signing his drawings when he was drawing them. He was signing them later, meaning that the ink of the see, signature and the ink of the drawing should be different. Uh, if they are the same, it is absolutely clearly a poetry. If they are different, it's still not a proof that this is not a forgery, but at least it is possible. So let us look at this. And now what we see here, we see here the signature on the top and the part of the torch on the bottom. And we see that these two inks are different. We look at the amount of copper and zinc divided by the amount of iron that is normalized to iron. And we see clearly that <clears throat> the torch has by far more zinc and less copper than the monogram. Then we also found, of course, all kinds of other different things in these drawings that were indicating that this is a real. Okay? So let's go over to other inks. I said that most of the recipes uh, mention iron vitriol. However, not necessarily. There are also inks without vitriol. And you'll find the recipes of these inks um, in, middle, in the Middle East and you find them in Africa. Unfortunately, you never find them in Europe. And of course, there was a question. Here's a, one of those recipes. You just take uh, a, a bar, and you take iron filings. You put them into, into um, acid. You can do it at home. You will see, you will get beautiful iron gold inks, very simply made. You don't need, no, you don't need any vitriol. Vinegar would do it. And, uh, but there was no recipes in, in Europe. 
So did they exist in Europe or did they not exist in Europe? And we found out that they did exist in Europe. And we believe that they existed exactly in the places where people were writing with plant inks. And here they started adding metal, starting adding iron, and they got to the uh, uh, wonderful iron gold inks, very high quality, without any need of vitriol. And vitriol is not something you can go and buy in every pharmacy and every place. So we have uh, quite a number now, meanwhile, uh, studying this uh, for many years, we have uh, found out quite a big number of manuscripts that were not using vitriol for making of the ink. So now quickly let us see how do we know with uh, um, XRF what kind of ink we look at. First of all, this is one, uh, uh, this is a, a, a spectrum of parchment. And in this spectrum of parchment, we see calcium, and we always see calcium in parchment because parchment is, first of all, it is skin, and secondly, it is prepared with lime. Then we see some iron, and iron is a metal that is very, very, uh, you know, frequent on the earth, and of course, you find it basically everywhere. Now, we look at the ink on this parchment, and we do not see actually any difference. This red uh, uh, curve is like black curve, this is plant ink. There is no addition of metals. Now we're looking at non-vitriolic iron gold ink. We see a big, uh, you know, the, the iron grows. This is green line, and you see iron here. It grows quite a lot. But there is, and we see that potassium grows. And potassium uh, always is in, in, in plant. And um, actually, it is <clears throat> uh, very often in the adhesive. So we are not astonished. But the only metals that we see here is iron. But now, if we go onto the vitriolic iron gold ink, in addition to iron, which is blue how, we see a great amount of copper and of zinc. So we have now different types of the inks that we can discern by uh, XRF. Another type of the materials that has uh, 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 that we found that had the, the inks that were not based on vitriol were the early medieval Torah scrolls. And the Torah scroll in, in Europe is a very big object. You can see it now in the, in the picture. Uh, this is a, a, a one of the, the oldest that we know in Europe. It is from the 13th century. When we started using studying, when we started studying this this scroll, and here you can see it's uh, the, the the picture. We are working now with imaging XRF. It's meaning that in our uh, work we can see the we trace the text with an element. So on the first picture we see the optical picture. We see very homogeneous color. When we go and look at the picture of iron, we suddenly see very uh, quite a big number of different intensities. On the right, it is very intense, and it is very pale, not intense in the middle. The third picture is picture of calcium. We basically know that calcium is in, this, in the parchment. Why? But here, clearly, we can read text on calcium, meaning that we have calcium in the ink. Now, let us look what happens here. Now we look at other elements in this in this uh, uh, um, scroll, and we see that the last line, which is basically has exactly the same color as all other lines, is written with a vitriolic ink. All the rest has basically no vitriol. It's only iron, but only this last line is written in vitriol. And I must say what I didn't say before: the medieval uh, uh, Torah scrolls were. Uh, <clears throat> corrected, improved, changed many times in their 1,000 years life. And so now we have a method to recognize different inks in different ways how it was corrected. Why is it important? It is because until 16th century, the layout of the Torah scroll was changing. It's only after the 16th century it became very uniform. So here in this scroll, Using imaging X-ray fluorescence, we found the way to basically describe all the methods of correction, find all the corrections on this scroll. 
Now, do I have, still have some time? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. Five minutes or seven, seven or eight? No, maybe more. I'll try it to be quick. We were speaking now about the machine, uh, instrumental analysis of different things. However, in my work, which is basically always interdisciplinary, uh, I find that it is very important that my partners from humanities understand what we do and understand how we do this. And only if both parties understand each other, we can come to a kind of a reasonable answer to a reasonable question. Otherwise, we just work near each other without uh, finding anything. And to, to this aim, I would like to speak about the interaction spot of the instrument. And this is because there are many different instruments and very often the question requires specific instrument and you cannot answer every question with every instrument. So now we're looking at the piece of, the, of a Dead Sea Scroll and we see this is an archaeological piece. You have skin, you have sediments, you have ink, also covered with sediments. And now we want to know how this was prepared, how the skin was prepared. We want to know what sediments are on top. We want to look at the ink. Now let us take a very small interaction spot, a small beam. I would say no one sees where actually this beam interacts with our, I'm, I'm showing with, with my, uh, here, here, this little red spot. And now, if one works with such a small spot, you would need 100 years to study such a fragment because every time you make a measurement, you have no idea whether it is an occasional measurement or is it a real measurement that you want. So if you need to use this spot, you have to look at a very small area in your fragment and have a very well-defined question. If you take a bigger spot like this one, which is 100 micron, you can basically characterize the whole uh, uh, fragment. You can look at the places where you have only a skin. You can look at the sediments. And since X-ray penetrates everything, so when you when you go onto any spot here, uh, if we go in any spot here, you measure actually everything which is under this spot. So it is very nice to look if you want to look at different spots that here you, for instance, look without any sediments. So when you compare this spot with sediments and without sediments, you know what actually caused by sediments. The same is with the ink. You have to find a clean spot on the ink and then you can see, remove everything which is underneath because you already studied it and then you can understand what is actually caused by ink. However, these are expensive instruments. Now, if we take a cheaper one, the normal size of the interaction spot would be about one millimeter. It's still workable. Maybe it is not the best, but you can still, you cannot separate any more sediments from the skin, but at least you can more or less separate sediment, uh, the, the skin from the ink. Unfortunately, the, the majority of the instruments would have the spots of this size. So if, you, if someone comes with you and wants to study your, your uh, objects with this type of the instrument, you have to think, well, what this type of analysis can answer. Yeah, this would be a very low spatial resolution, okay? Now, and before I finish, we will speak quickly about different tools, about different instruments that you can buy and acquire. And maybe you know them, so the first one would be just very easy, very quick uh, experiment with it. something which is called trace. It has a big, very big uh, uh, spot. However, if you have a painting, it's an excellent, it's an excellent uh, instrument. It is very light. The other one, which is the was used to be a working force of the archaeometry, especially especially of the uh, <clears throat> manuscript sciences. It is 70 kilograms you have. It is not portable, but it's transportable. And we can easily go over this anywhere. And it allows us to look at the scripts because it has a very small interaction spot. Now we can have also scanning ones. The upper one, which is a scanning, very light, very easy. However, it is has a very big interaction spot, and this is a problem for the scripts. We are asked the <clears throat> last one is the Ferrari of X-ray uh, of X-ray. This is a huge imaging uh, instrument. It is still 
possible to 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 try to travel with it and this is a, of course a preferable instrument if you have money and so with this there are tables of different inks how you understand them how you study them those tables can be sent to anyone on request they are here just to say that we have collected the data and here i would thank you thank you so much ira for this very fascinating truly interdisciplinary uh, lecture very thought provoking careful reflections of mm -hmm. methods advancements the limitations and uh, yeah, it needs to combine different methods. This is the moment where I can open the Q and A's, where we can open the Q and A in order to invite people to share their questions with you. Um, this is a reminder for everybody: you can use the chat function as well as the Q and A track function to ask your questions, we will monitor both of them, we'll then select these questions and convey them to the speaker. And I know there will be many questions out there. Um, there has, some of them um, have arrived already. Um, <clears throat> one of them is about the limitations of the written record and how the scientific uh, study of writing inks have uh, altered your understanding of these limitations. I guess this mainly regards um, this mainly regards your comments on the fact that such recipes have circulated after the actual use of such uh, inks. Um, maybe you want to say something about this for... Uh, <clears throat> I think the our main limitation of the... Uh, uh, and my main problem with the recipes from, from uh, antiquity and Middle Ages is the knowledge of the language. It is not very, sometimes and very often actually, we do not exactly know what was meant. And to my knowledge, there are quite a number of, of uh, projects that are trying to recreate these recipes and to understand what was actually put in there. The, my, the ones that I would like on would be uh, um, magic papyri. And I think that you have any number of magic recipes and it would be very interesting to know actually what was put inside. Now, our mobile tools give us only the metals, basically, what are the insides. So in, in order to really recreate something, even hoping that it has not deteriorated, we need a completely different type of analysis. We need extraction, and we need to, 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 to identify all the organic uh, components that were introduced in those, in those. So the limitation of the recipes is our knowledge of the language. Do we know actually what was put in there? And the question is, we know that it's based on copper, but exactly, is it vitriol? Are we sure it's vitriol? We're not. Another question has been regard has been about the difficulties of studying mixed inks and the need to combine uh, different uh, different scientific methods. Um, I suppose this is rather common, I suppose, but um, the kind of need for method advancement that it comes with the clients yes. that you get that you Well, know. one of the things that, that we learned when we, uh, when uh, um, a girl who made a PhD in, in our group, Zina Cohen was, was saying or was doing, she was working on, on the documents in uh, Cargeniza on contracts. And there, she found quite a number of mixed inks, but she was never sure whether they were really mixed inks or you just have one pen that you use first with one ink and then you use with another ink. In, in, um, in the Middle East, the use of uh, carbon ink and iron gold ink happened at the same time. So if you if you sit at some kind of an office and you have to sign your name and there is uh, different inks, you would um, just get it by mistake. One thing that we know for sure, I mean, I wouldn't say for sure, is that um, the people who were writing very seldom knew what kind of inks they were using. Maybe those in monastic communities, yes, but not in the normal life. They would go to the market and uh, let someone write a letter or they will buy the ink and this would be more or less directed by economic uh, questions. We have documents in which the change of carbon ink into iron gold ink ha happens in the middle of the sentence. And this can happen only if the person had no idea 
which ink it was used. And one of those documents is from the fourth, fourth century of our time as a magic uh, papyrus, and another is from the 11th century uh, from, from Cairo. So for years and years, people were just buying inks. And the important thing is that the inks were black. Absolutely fascinating, Rachel. Thank you very much. There has been another question uh, whether you or other researchers in the team or beyond have attempted to correlate different ink types against different substrates, comparing the use of inks on papyrus as parchments. <laughs> well, there was certainly at least two verbs that tried to do so. Um, uh, yes and no. As I just said, that you would have uh, maybe with the type of treaties, yes, not not with the type of substrate. We find iron gold ink on papyrus. Actually, one believed always that iron gold ink came up with parchment. And this is, one would say, because about, it coincides, about the fourth century of our time, the, the, um, the codex appears. I mean, it doesn't. It appears before, of course, but it becomes popular. It becomes one of the central uh, uh, types of the books. And about the same time, parchment becomes very important. And about the same time, iron gold ink becomes very important. So, naturally, many people thought it would come together. However, as we have, we have seen any number of documents uh, on papyrus written with iron gold. Ink. It just the erroneous impression is uh, came with a frequency, or let's say with the number of the books available. It's certainly, the books that are available in the fourth century, the number is much higher than the ones that were available in the first century, those that are preserved. So that's why we had kind of an erroneous impression that all the things came together. Parchment was known from the third century before our time. Dead Sea Scrolls, majority is written on parchment. Iron gold inks uh, started appearing about the third century before our time uh, on papyrus. So I would say there is no, but with the treaties, it could be. Mm -hmm. the type of them. <clears throat> Another more specific question is uh, has come up about the possible use of lamp black and bone black mm -hmm. in inks, and whether you could say more about this, whether you've come across the use of such ingredients in different kinds of carbon inks in particular? Well, if studying different types of carbon ink is very difficult, I would say. However, the bone black is easy to de determine because it's based on bone and that's why it has phosphorus and calcium. So this one, one can, can determine very easily. Um, the, this is found, of course, in, in the painting, this pigment, which one uses. In the writing ink, I have not encountered uh, um, bone black. Now, Soot or charcoal, this is a good question, because both can be in the, in the writing ink. And I would say the quality of the ink in soot is, is high protein. You see it by microscopically different types of, 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 the, of, the, of the particles, this would indicate. But differentiating, differentiating with different carbon inks is... I'd like to, uh, being aware of the time, I'd like to ask you a question about your vision for field. Uh, the for the field. So where do you where do you see the scientific research on historic things in 10, 15 years? What is your vision of what might be able to do at that time then? Um well, it's a good question. It's an invitation to speculate. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very bad in speculation. Um, I know that in the last 10 years, the studies of the historic inks took a real, there's a real moment. Everybody is studying them. Everybody is doing something. However, as long as we do not have a standard for study, we have difficulty of comparison. So in my opinion, if we want to have, uh, if we want to develop this, this, and what we want to develop, we want to date by ink. We want to say, we study the ink and say, okay, this type of the ink was encountered at that time, period of time in this geographic location, okay? This would be the ideal thing. And if you study a big number of manuscripts, you got a really a, a good uh, a result. You, you just need statistically relevant number of manuscripts. However, today we still have a problem of comparison. 
we study it with one instrument, they study it with another. We study it. It's like you go, you want to, to, to have blood analysis, and it depends on the lab you go. <laughs> so I think, I hope that within 15 years it would stop. Everybody would be using the same standard, uh, uh, same routine for measurement of the historic inks, and we will get a huge database, and this database will give us lots of answers. On this note, on the future, this is the moment where I can thank you again. Thank you so much for your fantastic lecture. This is also the moment where we'd like to stress that if there are any University of Manchester researchers out there who are listening to this talk, if you think about developing a material scientific research project on uh, such and other topics, please get in touch with the John Rylands Research Institute. We are very um, happy to support you with this. And Thank you all for your audience comments, your audience questions. As you know, this talk will be made available via the Ryan's YouTube channel. You can find more details on the webpage of the John Ryan's Research Institute and Library. Please also check the What's On page. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we hope to welcome you again soon in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.